This panel is on Empire in Question, uh, and we've been joined by David Pan, who also has a paper, which somehow didn't make into the program, for which I think I am exclusively to blame, so I apologize to David and to you all, uh, but it seemed the most natural panel uh, to include uh, David's uh, presentation into. So there will be four rather than three panelists, but I have been uh, promised by each of them that they will not uh, go on for much more than 15 minutes, so there will still be time. And if we have to cut a little bit into coffee, well, we'll try and keep that to five minutes or so. So we break the coffee around quarter to three or ten to three, uh, and there will of course be a plenary debate after that that will conclude the conference. So. Um, the first of our panelists is Wayne Hudson. I think none of the panelists need any introduction. If they want to say anything about their work before they do their presentation, that's great, but I won't introduce them anymore. Wayne, you have the floor. Thank you. It's late in the conference, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compress uh, the content and say something at the beginning and the end that may be useful for the whole conference. Because I think the substance of what I say, you already understand. You've already got it. I can give you infinitely more detail, but you get where I'm coming from. I will say it again, but I want to put a different front and a different end because it helps end the conference on a, on a way that may go forward. So in the first part of the paper, what I'm going to say is that uh, something about my political bias and why I think this is an important question. So I argue in a very large number of places that we need a global enlightenment, a new global enlightenment, that is not the enlightenment of the 18th century. It is based on the universe that is integrated with the contemporary natural sciences, that takes account of mathematics as well as all the humanities, and that critically inherits all of the world's philosophical and spiritual and indigenous traditions. So it's quite a big, aggressive, over-ambitious and slightly crazy proposal. And it is a proposal that I do make. Uh, and it implies, I think, that we need a new historical thought, and this historical thought can't be that of the Renaissance, or of Germany, or of Western Europe. So you've heard me say this before, so my next move is to say, Let's move out of the old historical thought and let's pay more attention to more, more analytical thinking, more precise definition of terms, and to a kind of naturalistic analysis of the organizational tendencies of the universe. And this, in a funny way, fits in with some of the Schmidt stuff, as I think you heard before lunch, because it fits in with the idea that what happens in history is not contingent, is not as arbitrary as it might seem, and has to do with repertoire and possibility. So there's a kind of mathematical probabilism behind the new historical thought that I advocate, and I apply it to global intellectual history, as you know. For example, one of the things I do is I show you that medieval Arabs and ancient Greeks and 18th century people all use the same argument spaces, whatever they say. They can say what they like, the argument spaces are not open to movement. So that's where I'm coming from. It's a big ask. Applied to empire, it has some interesting implications. One is that empire is probably not a proper term for historical explanation. It may be a proper term of historical description. You can have political discourses and talk about empire. But if you want causal explanation, I suspect you can't use empire because you can't use any junk term of this kind. Uh, in the same way, uh, you can't try to individuate empire unless you can say what an empire is and offer non-circular tests and non-analogical descriptions. And you just can't do what everyone in this paper does, which in this conference does, which is that there's an empire here, there's an empire there. Are they both had in common the rain? Um, no. <laughs> uh, it, it's not good enough. No, no, no. So uh, that's one implication. A second implication is, of course, that we asked about the endurance of empire. Where once you clean up the language and clean up what you're talking about, maybe they didn't endure. And lots of things that endured longer than empires weren't empires. So there's a fundamental muddle in this conference between lasting long and being an empire. Unless you want to argue ancient Egypt was an empire, otherwise you're in trouble. And then, of course, there are lots of Asian empires that last longer than the European ones you want to talk about. You just don't know about them, which is a pity. Uh, going on further on this general theme, as everybody knows, empires may be nations, and nations may be empires, and this distinction doesn't work. There are many books on that, so we shouldn't use it, and we've used it throughout the conference. I think that's not okay either. All right. So, a little bit more clarification before I move to some more substance. If we uh, are trying to clean up the empire discourse, we have to get rid of historical sociology. I don't know whether I have to decide that for you. If you don't know what's wrong with it, you haven't been reading the books for the last 30 years, you can't use a historical concept to explain historical change. You can't talk about the state over time without knowing what you mean. You can't talk about classes in societies that didn't have any classes. 
and so on and so on. You can't talk about the Greek policy when there wasn't one, etc., etc., etc. Well, sociologists don't know that. IR people don't know that. Political theory people don't know that. Well, sorry, but you need to know. I'm sorry, I can't help it. You need to know. And then if you want to talk about particular uh, regimes around the world, and obviously you do, well, you might ask which regimes. Well, if you want to babble about empire, well, why don't we at least have some superficial candidates? I found 80. In our conference, we've mentioned five. Most of them European, five. We've talked about India, but nothing really. We didn't mention a single Indian empire. You didn't even discuss the Maoris. That's an absolute disgrace. You mentioned China, but not any particular Chinese empire. So there's the Chinese empire, which is nonsense, of course. Uh, but then you don't discuss particular dynasties. And when you do, you can't pronounce the names. So we need to know that's not, if you want to be global, well, you should at least, you know, have some sense that it's Mao Zedong or uh, what other examples. Okay. Now, on the empires, I won't go through the 80 of them, but I will mention about five because you'll see the point. If we want to do a scientific study of empire, which I don't, but you do, all right, well, the first thing you have to do is look at the candidates. You have to do what you do with bees or rats or roses. What are the main sorts? You have to go through them. Well, we'd have to have the, the Sabathans, wouldn't we? And we'd have to have the Mongols. And we would do the Dutch Empire, and we'd know it wasn't an empire. You think it was an empire? Well, we're not thinking clearly about the lack of the company in its history. Uh, you'd have to do the Korean Empire, I think I mentioned that before, and you'd, you'd need something about obviously the two main Indonesian empires, and you should probably talk about Indonesia now, which is a much more credible candidate for empire than most of the ones you've talked about. So, a little bit more destruction, and then I move to something more positive. Uh, if you want definitions, I, I go through all that in Dave Dino, I don't think you need it. But, there's been a confusion all through this conference between culture, civilization, and political organization. People have wandered and wobbled over them, talked about civilization without knowing if they meant it in the French sense or in the German sense or in the Chinese sense. Uh, I don't think that'll... You have to sort the terms out, I think. And if you are going to even offer a crude definition of empire, you have to decide whether you mean a political organizational form that has a ruler then you need to know whether you think the ruler was a sovereign, and if so, what the test is. It can't be the vulgar test that we've heard in this conference, someone who seems powerful. If you want to use sovereign, you have to have a very strict account of sovereign. Well, no one did. I have a problem with that. And then you think an empire is a multi-ethnic uh, state or a mob with a whole lot of peoples. We need to define people. We need to know, if you say nation, I want to know what you mean by nation, and you better be citing John Patterson's book, or I'm not going to listen to you. If you haven't read the main book on nationalism, I don't think I should listen to you. Uh, it goes on a bit further. If you wanted to argue for geography, I mean, empire some of it. Yeah, big on the map. Lots of stuff read. Lots of stuff blue. Well, are you serious? Are you really serious that this is about geographical stance? Uh, and so on and so on. So I, I can take about nine, and I do it on the paper, take about nine different definitions of empire and show that they're fundamentally modelled. They're based on a historical thinking, and they're based on ridiculous geography, the sort you find in English books. You open the book, there's a map. Yeah, but what's the date of the night? When was the river there? Not, not at that time. Because rivers moved, of course. The whole geography shifts over time. And people at the time didn't have that map, of course. And so when you imply that they had to deal with the neighbours, they may not have known they were neighbours. This is the silk route for it. So, all right, if we set all that up, and then we can go into a general speech about illusions of empire, which I do, but there's a more important issue, isn't there? Because Russell Berman is right. There is a major discourse about empire. And whatever the matter of fact happens to be, we have to be able to negotiate the discourse about empire and say things about it. And we will need political speeches on one side or another. All of that is true. So what is the relationship between delusion and illusion? So that's my first substantive point. If you like. What's the relationship between illusion and delusion? It's very important to have a rather rigorous view of that. Because many people talk about illusion and delusion as the same thing. But quite obviously, any political regime will generate illusion. And any major state that writes its history will be writing something fundamentally false. No state in history has ever written anything true about itself substantially. They do tell fundamentally false things for good reason. That's what they're there for. That's why they do it. It's not done to tell God about his universe. He already knows. So we need to have a theory of why political bodies generate illusional discourse. And then we have to have a theory about why actors adopt delusional beliefs. But those two things are quite different. You have to be able to distinguish between generation of illusion by significant organizational form from delusion of actor, which has to do with all kinds of scientific matters that people here know as much about as I do or more, including the obvious fact that human memory basically fakes the past. When you remember what you did at the age of four, no, it doesn't stand up under the microscope. And when you do history and call it memory, uh, well, that's ridiculous. All right. So 
If you deal with this illusion point, then there's only one more point before we move to the next people. Obviously, we have to say something about shine in the German sense or, or something like semblance. We have to say that human political affairs are intrinsically riddled with illusional content. So you can't clean it up by putting on a science hat. In that sense, I'm always <coughs> a bit joking, but not totally. Um, you do have to have some account of how real political activity is affected by local forms of shine. And people have talked quite rightly about the French Empire in Africa, about the Ottomans, and you can talk about the Chinese in that context. It's perfectly fair to discuss how totally false views of the world were essential to how actual states worked and to how African or other subjects were formed. I think all of that is entirely right. And then you come to the moral issue and the normativity issue, and I think our conference muddled that up a fair bit too. Some people like empire, some people don't. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. You've got to be able to see that the horror of empire is quite independent from the objectivity of normativity. I mean, Jay's told you, right? Normativity is an objective process in the physical universe. Nothing to do with language or human beings or culture. That's all just humanity's junk. It's basic to semiosis in the natural world. Normativity has natural origin. We know that now. And it develops historically along the Galian lines, as Jay correctly argues, and it's nothing to do really with moralism. So whether you like empire or whether you don't, political forms generate real normativity embodied in institutions and in historical subjects. So it's the objectivist take on normativity we need, not the moralist. So I'm going to leave all the rest of this out. I go into the superficial model of empire and all the tendencies you all agree empires have. You went through them all, I go through, through them all. You talk about taxation and bureaucracy and coinage and, and all the rest of it. And I don't think there's anything significant. Thank you. Uh, so I, and then I go on to discuss what's wrong with all the English books. You don't do that. I want to end up on a more useful note, which I hope will carry forward in Telos, because there's something very important in our conference. And I think what it is, as, we, as, as Richard said, and I copied him very humbly, uh, we need a new form of human community. We really need to learn from what's happened in the 20th century that we cannot have this politics or this economics. It's not a left-right point. It's a technical engineering point. This is the wrong way to organize economies, this is the wrong way to organize politics, I think, and certainly the wrong way to organize military affairs, that's so evident. But how do we replace them? And obviously, part of the answer is to look at the whole of the repertoires that are found in the natural world and all the repertoires in the historical record. And if you do do that, you do, I think, begin to get technical elements for a future form of human community. I don't think this is a sentimental wallowing in the past. I don't think it's absurd to go to Australian Aborigines or Canadian Aborigines or Taiwanese Aborigines and look at what they're doing. I think we can look at all of the cases technically. And as you'd expect, as in any science, weird, strange ones give you the key scientific breakthrough. You know, it's the ones, the one leaf of that particular sort that isn't like the other 100,000 that told you, right, there's something wrong with your theory. And in the same way, historically, if you look at all of the material there's ever been, it's the weird cases that warn you that the technicity is crucial and doesn't work in the way your ideologies suggest it does. Now, I just give a couple of examples before concluding. Clearly, we want to get rid of the capitalist system, but not free enterprise and not all the things we all love. So what we can do is study, as someone has said, as Tim said, quite rightly, we can look as Marx did, if you haven't read one of the best books in the last 50 years, uh, Marx's Ecological Socialism, have a look. The, uh, the 32 volumes of notebooks that are now going to be published for the first time, which show that he was already working on, on all of this in the 19th century. We can look at all of the indigenous societies and we can see that value production of the capitalist kind is very new, historically rare, and can certainly be replaced. It's a simple technological problem to replace it with a different form of value production. You won't do that if you follow the current model in China. You won't do that if you follow the Soviet model in Russia. You won't do that unless you actually look at the data and find the technicity. And we need our friend over here who has a brilliant brain in this area because we need people who understand technicity. Don't ask me. I can tell you about the story and stuff, but I'm not the answer. So if we do that, we get a few very obvious hints. And Russell mentioned this at the beginning. We can see there may be merit in having multilingual states, and there's certainly enormous merit in having multilingual politicians and not allowing anyone to go to government like Mr. Trump or Margaret Thatcher, who can't speak any language, including their own. <laughs> the Chinese were right. The Chinese imperial examination required didn't pass the poetry exam. Only about 1% of students passed. In order to pass, you had to be pretty bright. 
Now you probably would use pure maths, but it's the same thing. You just get rid of these people at the beginning. So multilingual states, that's one possible outcome of an historical survey. A second uh, obvious outcome would be a cum based citizenship. Now the literature on citizenship has gone nowhere for 30 to 40 years because we've forgotten that citizenship can be a cum based. It can also be counterfactually based. After all, the New Testament tells us we're citizens of heaven. And that's been forgotten in modern political discourse. In modern terms, you talk about virtual reality as a possible citizenship to replace actuality. And you go to France for that discussion, and you learn something fast. There too. A last example, because I've been told to shut down so that David can get his paper. Um, <laughs> I think it's also useful in the same way to devise a new physically-based spirituality for the human race. I think part of the new community lies in teaching everybody spirituality in a highly scientific way and saying to them, you're going to change your brain by what you do. Why don't you change it this way? Because we've known what that will lead to and we can prove it will lead to that and we can photograph your brain for you. And so I think we can have a new form of human community which is multilingual, which is based on a Cuban-based citizenship and which has a strong spirituality program at the core. And if you apply that to the Islamic world, you'll see how useful my strange historical trick is. Because we can sit down with every Muslim and say, Allah be praised, you have preserved the truth in the age of error. We will now be able to learn from the Holy Quran. I know Muslim in the world is going to contradict that. <laughs> I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
comes a civilization, a remakes of civilization that is somewhat more savage than it supposedly was. All right, so that, in some sense, America is, uh, at least in the time that Schmidt's addressing, two empires. It's a land empire that expands as it goes from sea to shining sea, and this is going to manifest destiny, competing with other uh, powers from Europe, at times Spain, at times France, at times Russia, at times after Spain, Mexico. Uh, later on, France intriguing during the Second Empire. Later on, Germany intriguing during the Second Empire of, of Germany. Uh, and of course, in, inside uh, the interior west, Mountain West, we have the refugee LDS community creating their own state of Deseret, which has its own little foreign policy and tries to do certain things. So there's the building of a land empire that Turner says it's over in 1890. Okay, so in 1893 he publishes his essay, which is interestingly the same year that uh, enterprising American businessmen and uh, sailors from, I believe, a cruiser, the USS Boston, uh, enter um, in Oahu, the harbor, Pearl Harbor, and uh, overthrow the Queen and uh, establish a protectorate in order to. Uh, you know, advanced enterprise and whatnot. This, of course, it follows the acquisition of Guano Islands uh, by Alaska, uh, but there's a, an, an impulse to now a maritime empire that their competitors are uh, urging upon them because four years prior, what, William II, Felhelm II, says we need our place in the sun, so we need a blue water navy. Uh, the United States was making the transition from sail to steam, like the British, and they need coaling stations. Uh, they look around for where else they can get an empire, and their closest likely candidate are the Spanish. Okay, so you have a war in 1898, and you start seeing the basis of a sea-based kind of empire, which uh, comes from the acquisition of a very short war, didn't even last a year, with the Spanish Empire. We get the Philippines, Puerto Rico, <coughs> Cuba, establishing protectors over other places throughout the Caribbean. And the Great White Fleet sails around, and we look like we're big knockers, like other people from Europe, creating this, uh, you know, new maritime empire, which has a coexistent logic with the land empire, perhaps balancing out these self-defeating dynamics that Schmidt talks about. More importantly, the Wright brothers come along, and in 1903, that heavier than flying machines, uh, and of course, the United States is the first to experiment with using aircraft attack on capital ships proving that air power can defeat sea power in sufficient numbers used with the right strategy, even though it's the Japanese that bring that lesson home to us, December 7, 1941. We take that lesson, and with the 8th Air Force in, in Europe, the 20th Air Force in the Pacific, we bring air power to our Axis enemies, outclass our allies, and become, in a sense, an empire of the air, an aerial empire. Uh, in addition to that, what I want to say, and I, I'm, I may be taking somewhat license here, but I think it's, it's there in the Schmidt essay. In, uh, but beyond flight, he also talks about the, the air as, uh, and this is simplistic, but the, a, a site where radio waves, TV, TV transmissions, uh, let's say electromagnetic uh, media communications can fly, so that uh, we have a kind of strange mode of uh, aerial empire which is mediated through uh, aircraft, but also telecommunications, ultimately spacecraft, and with the internet in 1969, the kind of telematics. So it's a command of, both, uh, air, of land, of sea, of air, and cyberspace, wherever you want to put that, because I think that's a kind of generative spatiality that's machining, and you have this kind of capacity that makes, uh, if you will, the opportunity of uh, uh, a, a new kind of empire that, it, that you can explain by what Turner calls the frontiersman. And the frontiersman is the civilized person who is constantly made, in a sense, more savage by a different kind of enemy that uh, the, uh, the Americanization comes through violent contact. So the first, the conquest of North America from the Native Americans, the, to a certain extent, uh, Mexico, uh, 
declared one in lower 48, bring in the last three states, which are essentially, you know, Bantu stands for Native Americans. And where do you go after that? Well, the Pacific into the Caribbean. Okay, so we, we, we have an empire, and then in addition to that, after World War One, and World War II, which is kind of chapter one, chapter two, we develop nuclear energy, and in a sense have, we are the world hegemon. Arguably, maybe the greatest apogee of our power in terms of military capacity, everybody else being relatively prostrate, but the, the, the articulation now of a new kind of empire of bases which are both naval bases, submarine bases, bomber bases, some missile bases, and uh, a, a kind of aerial imperialism that seems to be the basis of the contest with the Soviet Union uh, through the Cold War. Um, in this, you know, because I kind of like, it's interesting, a couple of my friends do this, what they call cinematic geopolitics. So, you know, think of Red River. Okay, the Howard Hawks 1948 film, right? Montgomery Cliff, uh, you know, John Wayne, you know, this is this is virgin land. First we kill the Comanches, and a couple of heroes come up and they say, well, this belongs to somebody in Mexico, you shoot them. Uh, you, you come up with your own brand, you have one cow, you start your herd, and then you decide to drive your beef to Sedalia, and there's a fight over that. Actually, you go to, uh, you know, to Topeka further down the line, but it's the, the frontiersman, the European, made Americanized by this contestation with the local inhabitants plus nature. Okay, so this is one kind of, you know, that kind of vision of land empire. Then, you know, we, we kind of have sea empire, all right? So, you know, you got, uh, you know, Glenn Ford in Midway, you got John Payne in Tripoli, uh, you got, you know, all kinds of, uh, the, 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 from Paul's amount, you know, the the shores of Tripoli to the halls of Montezuma, you know, sort of a vision of, of Americans, you know, projecting their power not only through land power, but also through uh, sea power. And uh, then with that, with aerial empire, you know, let's throw back to William Holden, the bridges that took over Reed, Jimmy Stewart in probably the best movie of this kind of genre, Strategic Air Command, right? We're flying around thermonuclear bombers, it's kind of like a day job. And, you know, goes on for two days. June Allison's waiting at home. They make the transition from B 36s to B 47s. You're a baseball player. It's all America. You're just doing your job. You're defending your peace and your strength. And, you know, it's just it's just normal. You know, we're in charge and everybody loves it. Uh, and uh, ordinarily, you would have been a baseball player, but you're defending peace and making things secure. Uh, after that, uh, yeah. Then we move to this kind of uh, uh, later post Cold War aerial empire, which is you know gets us into Black Hawk Down or American Sniper or um, you know Zero Dark Thirty. Okay, where we, we live in new kinds of bases that are called forward operating stations, often, and all kinds of things can come to you through American air power. But then I start thinking about, well, what about the realm of fire? And that's more speculative, but I started talking about uh, extraplanetary <coughs> spatial revolution in terms of uh, made possible by, you know, orbital telecommunication satellites to mediate that kind of communication. But also, we you know, water on the moon, uh, you know, terraforming Mars. Uh, from V2 rockets in 44 and 45 to us landing on the moon in 1969. And of course, there's Matt Damon there growing potatoes on Mars, uh, setting, setting, setting an example for what the new frontiersman has to do for an Earthian to become a Martian. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's that kind of, you know, use of uh, just preliminary, just speculative, kind of playing with uh, the different kind of frontiersmen in different frontiers, playing upon different elemental elementalities, creating spatialities of power through new technologies. Uh, and then the kind of base or footprint that American power uses to do that without necessarily creating something like the many empires of Wayne tells us don't exist because we don't call them the right names or we don't know where the rivers ran. So uh, that's kind of what I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Again, wonderful combination of 15 minutes and lots of really uh, great.
point to discuss later. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is um, Adam Webb uh, from John Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, and the title of the presentation is From the Political Honeycomb to the Unbundling of Sovereignty, Cosmopolitanism, Tradition, and Liberty in the Future Global Constitutional Center. This is some of the themes in this are actually a topic of a Thank you. Uh, book project I'm working on, which is basically in, in political theory in, in the broad sense. Um, and the argument I'm looking at in the book is the idea that in this century, probably within a couple of generations, um, world state formation in some sense or a future global constitutional settlement will uh, become a live political issue. And I think that this is something which needs to be taken seriously, particularly by critics of liberal modernity, that if you know, we don't generate um, an alternative way of thinking about this future global constitutional settlement, we may end up with something which is, in some ways, even more off-putting than what we've seen at the national um, level. Uh, now, in some ways, I'm framing this um, kind of alternative vision as the, the unbundling of sovereignty, as moving away from what I call the political uh, honeycomb. Now, the term political honeycomb is its quite similar to the Westphalian system in what it's referring to, but it's shifting the emphasis um, somewhat. It's highlighting certain features of the Westphalian system or the Westphalian um, state. Uh, the political honeycomb basically means that the global landscape is broken up into these units which are marked politically, right, by statehood and by, by citizenship, often in a way that gives the political sphere supremacy over other spheres of um, society. And one of the manifestations of that is the so-called container society, which is a term that some social scientists use for the idea that the nation state is the natural unit of analysis, that social processes mainly unfold within these territorial um, units. Um, so in some sense, the, the triumph of the political honeycomb in modernity is not only a question of scale, right? It's above the, the local level, but smaller than universal empires, civilizations, and all the units. It's also a, a qualitative triumph, right? It's the dominance of the state over um, society, the dominance of the polity over society. And we see this kind of affirmation of the, the logic of the political honeycomb in, in many cases. One of the most interesting today is the backlash against migration. Right? If we look at what Western populists are often doing, they are reaffirming the political honeycomb in the sense that they want to heighten the distinction between citizens and foreigners, and they want to use the, the voting power of the majority of citizens to tighten borders at the edges of a politically defined unit. And when we see this narrative about taking back control of borders, stopping immigration, etc. In a sense, this is the an affirmation of the borders supremacy over social ties, networks, expectations, and a broader social space of, of openness. Um, now, when we look at the rise of um, new Asian powers, countries like China, we can see that in some ways they want to change the content of the political honeycomb, but not really its form. So they suddenly have this narrative of cleansing the grievances of Western uh, imperialism and recentering power away from the West, but they are still very much um, uh, affirming these, these politically defined units, right? the dominance of state uh, over society. Um, indeed, one of the um, sort of facts which I think runs counter to any idea that rising Asian powers represent a genuine alternative global openness is if you look at the views of much of public opinion and certainly official narratives in countries like China about matters of race and immigration, it makes the Trumpians and the Brexiteers look positively cosmopolitan by uh, comparison. Um, now, if you look at how we might be moving away from this political honeycomb, there is obviously one or several experiments which um, mark one kind of alternative. If we see something like the European Union, clearly this is a trajectory of regional and global integration, which at least seems to be moving away from the, the honeycomb aspect of the political honeycomb. Right? If you look at the EU vision of the single market, the four freedoms, freedom of movement of people, and so on, this certainly seems to be voting for openness. It seems to be transcending these Westphalian-style um, units. Uh, at the same time, the price of that common global space that EU-style advocates um, envision, the price of that really is a much tighter web of global regulation, functional integration, and technocracy. And indeed, we can say that the leading edge of the European Union and other kinds of global um, supranational integration experiments really is what Milovan Dilas called the new class, right? Um, this kind of technocratic stratum which sees regulation and regulatory integration as the, the, the necessary component of constructing uh, cross-border um, openness. 
Um, and one of the other, um, I think, notable features of the new class as, an, uh, as the architect of this kind of prevailing vision of global integration is that they are generally deeply hostile to the traditional values of the global majority. So they may be open in a sense, but it's an openness which runs counter to the public opinion and beliefs of a large swath of the world's uh, population. Um, indeed, the, um, the threat to, to tradition is matched only by the threat to liberty in the sense that this impulse to regulate, right, this impulse essentially to scale up the ambitions of the model state to these new global government structures also represents a, a threat to liberty on many more pluralist um, accounts. Now, if we think about where this kind of trajectory might lead, Right? There are some fairly eerie or even deeply alarming things about where this might lead in terms of the future global constitutional setting. And here we see a rather alarming convergence between the, the Western new class on the one hand and rising Asian technocratic elites on um, the other. Um, regardless of which one of these ends up closer to the future uh, global centers of power, um, we can see that you know, some may leave the political honeycomb more intact, some may scale it up to other units, but one of the things they have in common is that they actually have one of the most one-dimensional or one of the narrowest understandings of social stratification in history. Um, a couple of times Wayne mentioned the, uh, the, the obsession with exam-taking among the Chinese bureaucracy. Um, but whatever, whichever language you put on this, right, whether we talk about the credential society or the organization heads or the cognitive elite and so on, we see both in rising Asian powers like China and in the case of the modern Western uh, new class, a profound convergence in terms of the civic mechanism that modern higher education provides. Right? If you look at any of the sort of top layer of Western or Asian societies and ask how many of these people did not go through a modern university system. Right? You'd be pretty hard pressed to find any broader diversity in terms of people's basis of power and socialization and what they connect to in society. So there is a real social convergence in terms of stratification um, happening here. And I think that this marks a very dramatic um, decay of heterarchy. Heterarchy is a term which um, I think originally came out of IT, but it's been used as a tool in social analysis, first in archaeology and to some extent in other social um, sciences. And heterarchy is basically the idea that um, power and honor in a society are distributed along more than one axis, right? So you may have a heterarchical society in which you have certain bases of power in the economy, some in relations to political power, um, maybe certain kinds of traditional social authority, religion, etc. So this kind of new class convergence across the world is actually a real concentration of power and a decay of a lot of the buffers on power that more heterarchical traditional societies um, have. Um, so this, I think, is one of the, the alarming things that we see in terms of the way the world is, is going. Right? Um, if you look at the trend line for probably the, the most educated top 10% in, in these different societies, there is a profound trend everywhere towards greater hierarchy and conformity and aversion to risk and comfort with authority. This certainly does not go well for um, either tradition or liberty in the kind of future global constitutional settlement that I imagine these people would be building by, by default. This is why we see the, uh, the grandchildren of Western countercultural liberals uh, admiring technocratic governance in parts of Asia and the grandchildren of Maoist revolutionaries joining the global uh, investor class. So we can say that the center of gravity of the kind of emerging establishment vision of, of global constitutionalism, it may not, it lies somewhere I think between Brussels on the one hand and maybe not quite Beijing on the other hand, but at least Singapore um, on the other hand. And I think this should unsettle anyone who would like to see a more traditional kind of, of pluralism. Um, indeed, the scale and complexity of modern institutions gives the new class levers of power of modern society that are, I think, unprecedented in, in history. So this is why I'm, I'm seeing a potentially dark future if we don't engage systematically with alternative resources for thinking about what a uh, global state structure might, um, might look like. Um, and what I'm aiming to do in the in the book and what I briefly want to outline in the, uh, in the second part of the uh, talk here is I think that there are important currents of traditional political thought which actually provide a more promising way of reconciling three different kinds of goods or values. So cosmopolitanism, liberty, and tradition. And it may seem very strange to have those three together, but I think that if you look at the logic of 
some of the oldest civilizations or universal empires, you actually do see a kind of reconciliation of cosmopolitanism, liberty, and tradition in this. And this, I think, is the kind of question which needs to be brought to the center of these debates about what the global political or constitutional future um, might look like. I think one of the, the key priorities for anyone committed to pluralism should be making sure that that world constitutional framework really affirms heterarchy for the long term and locks in buffers against the power of technocracy, political majorities, and these other kinds of um, temptations. Now, obviously, there are many different traditional um, currents of political thought of a pluralist um, temper. Um, when it comes to unbundling sovereignty or fragmenting power in this way and preserving diversity, I want to identify one which I think provides a particularly useful um, toolkit. And this is um, sphere sovereignty. I don't know if anyone has actually heard of this. It's a somewhat obscure corner of um, political thought which came out of Dutch um, Calvinist thought originally. Um, Abraham Kuyper and Herman Wilber are probably the two leading intellectual figures who articulated this in the, the early to mid 20th century. And like many traditional pluralists, they frame sphere sovereignty as an alternative to both the revolutionary left and the authoritarian uh, right. And they came, as I said, out of the Calvinist tradition where they thought that one should think of sovereignty as residing with God rather than with the, the state or the, the demons. And by sphere sovereignty, what they essentially were arguing is that the, the natural um, order was a refraction of sovereignty through multiple spheres of the individual believer's life. Right? So you may have an individual who is, at the same time, the citizen of a political community with the state having a certain limited kind of public political power, but at the same time as equally a member of a family, a religious denomination, uh, an economic entity, a locality, maybe a, a, an educational institution, all of these different um, spheres. And because they were basing this on a, a kind of philosophical anthropology or a deep understanding of human nature grounded in their religious values, they believed that these spheres were not simply social constructs. They believed that these corresponded to certain deeper dimensions of human flourishing. And because each of these spheres had a kind of natural function for the state or indeed any other modern institution to encroach upon them or to claim a kind of sovereign supremacy across all spheres would be deeply deforming the nature of um, those spheres uh, themselves. Um, I should point out this is a little different from the way that um, Michael Walzer talks about spheres of justice. For Michael Walzer, this is still very relativistic. Right? The spheres of justice are products of conversations in a particular society at a particular time, whereas um, Kuyper and Villiard are really saying that these are, in some sense, grounded in human nature or grounded in human um, experience. Um, now, what I want to say here is that I think this can offer a useful toolkit for thinking about a future global constitutional setting. Right? If you want heterarchy, if you do not want to hand everything over to the modern new class, global constitutional formation should not be about making power more efficient or more concentrated, it should be about breaking it down in this kind of way. And I think that needs to be a starting point for thinking about it. Um, I, I put on the outline there um, a few examples of what this might look like um, concretely. And this is, I think, one point of contact with this idea of the old style universal um, empires. Um, if you strip down the, the role of the state as such to the, the most limited function of the political sphere, namely providing public order, public security, etc., this actually looks very like the back the state of the 19th century. Right? It looked like the old layering of the universal empires where you have security at the top, but then a very vibrant society with a great deal of independence within these spaces in society um, instead. At the same time, this is very different from a kind of mainstream libertarian view where that space would then simply be filled by the market and contractual exchange among individuals. Right? This is really about affirming not so much the market, it's more about affirming society. Right? So there are several possibilities I mentioned there for institutional um, arrangements. One is, if you are envisioning a genuine open global space, then you need certain counterweights to free movement, right? things which can defend people's sense of roots and identity. So certainly I would think that a global constitutional settlement should enshrine a significant role for local autonomy, right? where people have a local, a strong long-term commitment to a locality play a predominant role in shaping the life of that locality. You can still have openness, but you can preserve local character at the same time in a way that the modern nation state has tended to, to flatten out. Um, on the level of personal law, right, for dealing with things like family personal law issues, you could go back to something like Islamic legal pluralism, right, where you can have choice of personal law systems which are detached from territory. If you want a genuine 
global space, you need to re leave room for these kinds of thick commitments that people can take with them in a more portable way than the political honeycomb um, allows. Um, by the same token, if you think of the social safety nets, social insurance, medical care, things like that, right, you can guarantee in the meta-constitutional structure a certain flow of resources to finance these, but then build in all kinds of pluralism, mutualism, and choice in terms of how people are using their entitlements to those um, resources. And the, the final point I mentioned there was something like a civil society time, right? If you're trying to empower society rather than simply state or market, you need to guarantee, again, at the meta-constitutional level, an adequate flow of resources into civil society. So you might have a situation where people can actually allocate part of their income to causes or activities in civil society, right? So you're guaranteeing the resources, you're placing them beyond the excesses of both market and state, but you're also um, creating the material conditions for this kind of pluralism and diverse bases of power and influence. Um, and then just to close, I would say, you know, repeating my, my earlier point that world state formation, I think, should not be about making power more efficient or more concentrated. It should be about locking in these kinds of boundaries and restrictions on power. I think many people quite rightly fear that any kind of global structure could be a dark night of tyranny, I think is the term that has been, been used before. But that's partly because people are imagining the modern nation state, the modern Leviathan, scaled up to a global level with no outside. So this vision, I think, instead suggests unbundling sovereignty in ways which actually very much limit what that kind of global state could do, but would go back to a more traditional model of empowering these spaces in society. Because in the long run, I think we need to be wary not only of concentrated power, new class, lack of heterarchy, but also political majorities, which at a global level could be tempted to do certain things which would deploy state power against um, social diversity. Um, so this is just a broad outline, I think, of what, what it might mean to unbundle sovereignty, and what it might mean to draw on the resources of tradition to preserve liberty within that more open future global space that I think is, is coming one way or another. Thanks. Mm. Thank you uh, very much, Adam, for a very rich uh, presentation. Again, yeah, throwing up lots and lots of issues. We will have a bit of time to uh, debate those, as well as those arising from the other presentations after David's paper, which has a very short title. It's called Empire Today. Not sure. <laughs> Together, they create a nice balance. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, as we consider the contemporary situation in empire, Carl Schmitt's essay, Appropriation, Distribution, Production, provides a good starting point. Schmidt describes nomos, i.e. social order, in this text as the result of a process of appropriation, distribution, and production, where appropriation designates the hard power of military conquest, distribution includes the division of the land amongst the people, as well as the laws and customs that regulate relationships between people, and production refers to the economic activity by which a social order is able to create wealth. Schmidt argues that these three elements of social order are, quote, elementary, elementary and true categories that are both basic and inclusive, end quote, which is to say that every social order can be exhaustively understood using only these three categories as their interrelation defines the parameters of every system. In order to establish a social order, the military power must be combined with an effective set of traditions that define the relationships within a conquered space. At the same time, military power requires for its long-term reproduction an, e an economic order that can maintain the strength of the military in terms of numbers, material, and techniques that can, that can ward off potential enemies. Appropriation, distribution, and, and production consequently all depend on each other in order to maintain the sovereignty of a social order in a particular space. Now, such a social order can take many forms, such as a city-state or a nation-state, but Schmidt's interest in Nomos of the Earth is in social orders that establish order between smaller units of social order. And we may treat this formulation as a basic definition of empire. In a formulation from his essay, Schmidt indicates that, quote, the essence of imperialism lies in the precedence of appropriation before distribution and production, end quote. Military conquest is here the main task of an empire. And if this precedence of appropriation was for a long time undisputed, it was because pre-capitalist production was a function of the land, and the ability to own fertile land was the consistent measure of wealth. The most successful empires, such as the Roman and Chinese, 
maintained their power on the basis of their stability, of their ability to achieve the stable conditions for successful agrarian production over large stretches of territory, and then effectively tax this production in order to maintain a system of imperial, of imperial power. Through this long period of agrarian-based economies, the main parameters of production were not variable. Rather, the key variables that determined the rise and fall of empires were appropriation and distribution. Every empire originated with a land conquest, and then the continuing success of an empire depended on the ability to establish a basis for relations between different peoples within the same space. Empire required a conception of order, encompassing a set of customs and traditions by which different parts of the empire could re relate to each other in a peaceful way. The institutions of Roman law and the customs of the Chinese tributary system provided such stable systems and were so successful that they were able to often co-opt their potential conquerors. The Chinese empire was singular in this regard as its conquerors from the Mongols to the Manchus did not replace the Chinese system of order, but merely occupied and accommodated themselves to that system. If conquest is the origin of imperial order, the institutions of order become the basis of long-term stability. After establishing these three basic characteristics of older empires, Schmidt then argues that in the modern era, the precedence of appropriation has been called into question by both liberalism and socialism when they emphasize the primacy of production. With capitalism's advances in productive capacity, conquest is no longer the key to unlocking the productive potential of the land. Instead, the socialist vision of the, quote, freeing of productive, productive powers, end quote, sought to create a situation of so much production that conquest is no longer an issue. Quote from Schmidt, progress and economic freedom consist of freeing productive powers, whereby such an increase in production and, and in the mass of consumer goods brings appropriation to an end, end quote. But if the socialist vision has come to an end, it is because production itself has not freed itself from the effects of appropriation and distribution. Rather, the experience of the economic travails of socialism, as well as the diverse economic performance of different parts of the world in an era of capitalism, has demonstrated that successful production in a particular place depends on the forms of order that provide the overarching political and social structures within which economic production can take place. The extent of the variation in productive capacity that different economics, economic orders can achieve has meant that military power is tied to economic performance. If the Soviet Union established a socialist order as the basis of its empire, its fall was not the result of its conquest by another power, but of the inability of its system to create the production that could maintain both its military power and its legitimacy. Similarly, as stable as the situation of sovereignty has been in China over the last 70 years, it is only the rapid increase, uh, the rapid recent increase in productive capacity that has enabled the rise of China's military and political power. This rise has come about not through any new conquests of land, but purely through a reordering of social and economic relations that has led to the establishment of capitalism within China. If the key to increasing political power has become independent of land conquest and shifted to productive capacity, this productive capacity itself has shown itself to, to be dependent on the details of the system of order in a particular place. The future of empire is stood, understood here as the overarching order by which different peoples relate to each other thus depends in the first place upon the competition between different systems of order in terms of their ability to create the basis for increasing production. The main contemporary question here is the extent to which the Western liberal order centered around the U.S. can maintain its primacy in the face of the rise of China and its model of authoritarian capitalism. We can understand both of these orders as forms of empire. The U.S. in the 20th century demonstrated the way in which its form of empire depend, uh, depended less on conquest and more on a system of order and ensuring production that spreads across the world and establishes a basis for relations between people. There are two key components to the, to the U.S. system, liberalism and the nation state. Liberalism consists firstly of a system of political customs based on the rule of law, individual rights, free elections, private property, and market mechanisms. The focus on individual rights and free elections leads to a requirement of a relative homogeneity within each state that would guarantee the basic ability of basic ability of elections to lead to a manageable consensus rather than to the domination of one group by another. As such, the way in which this model understands relations between peoples is in terms of separate nation states. These nation states require a minimum of homogeneity in order to function, whether this homogeneity is established based on, based on ethnic identity in the case of most nation states or uh, based on a common commitment to liberal principles as is the case with the U.S. The relationships between nation states are governed on the one hand by market mechanisms that determine their economic fates 
based on their ability to compete in the world market, and on the other hand, by the rules of the U.S. enforced this was failing international order based on the prohibition of land conquest and the general attempt to maintain the cultural integrity of nation states. What is happening to this system? In the U.S., the rise of Trump has not changed the basic parameters of the U.S.-led liberal order. The main long-term effect will be a refinement of this order in a way that emphasizes the particularity of this order and the way in which its principles will, will exclude certain players. The designation of the liberal world order as a form of empire is here important as an indication of the future directions of U.S. foreign policy. Trump's, and in fact before him, Obama's policy of gradual disengagement from the, from the problems of the Middle East represent a realization that these areas, to the extent that they do not adhere to liberal ideals, are in fact outside of the reach of the liberal world empire. If the attempt to expand this empire through conquest in Afghanistan and Iraq have been visible failures, the current policy has been to support liberal governments such as Israel, but to treat the non-liberal areas as enemies that should be treated differently from liberal ones. In a subtle, in a subtle shift to a world of competing empires, U.S. disengagement from occupation in the Middle East is an admission that liberalism is a particular cultural form whose, hegem whose hegemony will depend on historical developments within particular areas rather than conquest and occupation. The new way of engagement with non-liberal areas such as the Middle East is to treat these areas as competing civilizations, perhaps, that must be opposed to the extent that they seek to expand beyond their frontiers and tolerated and managed from the point of view of realpolitik to the extent that their conflicts remain within their own borders. Thus, Trump's willingness to come to accommodations with Iran, North Korea, and Russia seems to reflect an acceptance of their existence as general enemies of the liberal order, but also a willingness to allow them to remain as stable enemies as so long as they themselves are not aggressive. The main means of establishing such demarcations are the economic sanctions that have served to cut off these countries from the economic systems of the liberal order, with the goal of rendering these countries harmless to this order by forcing them to give up the nuclear weapon to give up uh, the nuclear weapons and aggressive policies that would threaten liberal areas. We are moving then toward a world of competing empires. On the one hand, the U.S. oversees the world's liberal democracies as a liberal form of empire based on homogeneous nation states and the political and economic liberalism that manages relationships between them. On the other hand, the Middle East and Russia remain outside of this liberal space and adhere to an alternative form of empire that is less centered on production and more on conquest. Rather than the elections of liberal democracies that require a basic homogeneity in order to function effectively, their authoritarian political structures are able to encompass competing and heterogeneous social orders within a larger imperial order by conquering them and then maintaining the, legit the legitimacy of imperial power based on an overarching non-liberal ideology. A clear example of this model is the Soviet Union, whose communist system was able to pr provide the legitimating ideology that could maintain order between different social groups within its borders, and Iran seems to be trying to use Shia Islam as a similar kind of overarching imperial ideology. If Russia is having a difficult time now in maintaining its imperial status, it may be because, without communism, the main state ideology has become a kind of Russian nationalism, which forces Russia to engage in empire building through the model of nation-based nation settler colonialism in neighboring areas. To the extent that this model awakens their neighbor's own nationalist impulses, the current Russian model will, will remain limited because it engenders more and more resistance as it expands. The main challenge to liberal empire is clearly China. If China's model of authoritarian capitalism has become the main challenger to liberal order, it can only do so to the extent that it can establish its own form of order and become the center of a new kind of empire that might exist in competition with liberalism. liberalism. What are the main characteristics and resulting possibilities and challenges of, these, of the Chinese system? Supporters of this system, such as Daniel Bell, point to an authoritarian political system based on a meritocracy, as well as a form of state-sponsored capitalism that focuses on, focuses on large corporations that profit from an integration with or outright ownership by government entities. The advantages of this system include the ability to apply technocratic solutions quickly and efficiently without the need to gain democratic consensus, as well as the ability to make huge investments in research, in research and infrastructure in projects that are deemed important to the state. If dissent is suppressed, such suppression is not destabilizing to the extent that the established policies are successful in bringing about economic and social well-being. To the extent that, this, that the model is successful, it can also be exported to other countries that are amenable to an authoritarian means of promoting economic development. 
The detractors of the system fault the meritocracy with building a new class, a new class bureaucracy that is plagued with corruption and is increasingly losing its legitimacy. At the same, at the same time, the state-sponsored model of capitalism has been established at the cost of the development of small businesses and entrepreneurship, leading to both a crisis-prone system of large corporations and a long-term inability to innovate. China's current debt overhang and the continuing risks posed by the inefficiency of state-run corporations um, lead David Shambaugh, for instance, to argue that China is properly headed towards stagnation within a, within a middle-income trap that can only be overcome to the extent that it moves toward more liberal and less authoritarian policies. Moreover, China faces the same problem as Russia to the extent that its Marxism has all but disappeared as an ideology of empire, leaving nationalism as the main form of legitimation and leading to the same nationalist reaction in areas such as Tibet and Xinjiang that China is trying to control through its own form of nation-based settler colonialism. So um, I've got just a couple of scenarios for the future, but I'm going to leave that for the questions if somebody's interested. Good. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, David, for another very rich uh, presentation, and I do hope the uh, material on the future scenarios can come, you know, can be mentioned as part of the question. So you've been incredibly patient, so I'm going to take questions. Uh, so we've got Jay, we've got Tim and Martin on this side, and we've got Joanne. Matthew and Stephen on that side, as well as Andrew. Now that's seven people. We're not going to take seven questions all at once because I think that might be too much. So we we'll start with four and three, but please keep them as concise as you can. Okay, no long descriptions possible. A question. That's all right. Just in the interest of debate. Jay. So yeah, thank you for those very rich presentations. Uh, but I particularly have a question for Adam. Um, I think pertaining to your, I don't remember the phrase used, the possibility of dark tyranny, something like that. I, I'm just wondering where Weber's famous uh, notion of political fits in into the scheme of um, uh, global constitutional settlement facilities in, in terms of, uh, I guess, a, a state monopoly on violence, right? Um, how would uh, the monopoly, monopoly or monopolies on violence be uh, apportioned in this uh, type of scenario? Uh, let's take those four and then we'll see how uh, you know, the response. Tim is next, then Martin and Andrew. Sorry, my name is also to Adam. Uh, the, the only thing that occurred to me when you were talking about this uh, multi level system is um, how do we keep track of all the different things being governed? Uh, so I, I just wondered if you could tell me, give, me, give us an example of. Institutions that are already there that may not be perfect, but it's the kind of thing that you're thinking about. Martin? My question is uh, for uh, Tim. I can't develop so all of my thinking because of time, but to be short, uh, the concept of military basis is uh, linked to the concept of theater of operation. Uh, and in this, I can develop this, but with this basic system US from US, all the world is a potential theater of operation. In other uh, panel, we are talking about the order, the world order of uh, and I want just to uh, know how you could uh, join uh, this problem of basis with this world order. Okay, thank you. That's question inspired by Wayne's comments on language, although I think it may also be relevant for Ada, and it's that you seem to pose a special challenge for pursuits like comparative philosophy and comparative political thought, and that terms and concepts like political, sovereignty, humanness are not translatable across traditions. Indeed, a term like tradition is not translatable across traditions. So just inviting your, your thought on that. All right, which goes, I'll suggest in the order of the speakers initially. So, Wayne, if you want to take out this question, and Tim. Yes, I do think that comparative thought and comparative philosophy, both of which I know a great deal about, are rubbish. Uh, but not just for linguistic reasons, but because we can objectively compare things. It's absolutely possible. But you don't use either Western concepts, as they do, or the words of the local actors, which is the kind of particularist 
Alternatively, go back to Russell at the beginning to understand comparative data, and this is everything I've said in this entire conference, you must logically ascend. You must ascend to logically more powerful ideas. You don't use the words of the actors. You don't use Western political concepts. You have to logically ascend, and then you can, to use your very example, compare seven theories of uh, governmental form in seven languages over 7,000 years of difference, and you can show where they fall in the mathematical model exactly. So rationalism is true, but you do have to have stronger logic and not comparative words. So I think we agree. Okay, thank you. Very short and concise. Tim. Um, the idea of yes, how, how territorialized are bases. So to a certain extent, um, I think this, there, there is an inversion sort of headwork that many people would see developing arguably out of international government organizations, maybe beginning even with the UN, definitely some of the containment alliances, the strongest one that survives is NATO. It's actually been used as a collective defense against different kinds of threats. And that uh, you can have kind of bases that are little Americas where essentially there's kind of a you know a little American enclave that goes back to the fifties that exists or some so called forward operating stations where, you know, two C one thirties, a helicopter attack group land in Mali throughout at the end of the week. Okay, so that Oh, under what conditions this is negotiated, I think it, it, it already, to a certain extent, we're testing this sort of thing. Uh, nobody seems to want the Chinese being the night watchman. Nobody seems to want the Russians being the night watchman. It isn't maybe the empire we should have picked up, but to let go of it is what the United States has started as a disaster it just did. So, they do not do a great job, but just sort of says that's what we are doing. Uh, how limited it is, how effective we are at it is, it, is another question. But I think there are many conditions where you can negotiate extraterritoriality that's weak to small and temporary to almost permanent uh, and even uh, stealthy and clandestine. And, uh, so it's, yeah, it's just a question of you know when and how you, you need to exercise power, and all of which are aggravating usually to people where the power is being exercised or located, which creates a lot of blowback, which is what you know Thomas Johnson said. Yeah. So, uh, it's a response to my question, but people uh, don't yeah. get it. Uh, have you have a coffee? Thank you. Adam, two questions to you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try and combine it. This is actually a whole chapter of the book, so I'll try and be brief in a way that will be more suggestive and, and thorough in answering it. Um, I think if, if you're trying to lock in this, this logic of sphere sovereignty as the sort of deep meta constitutional structure of the settlement, then having the state, in a sense, being a judge of its own cause would be very misguided. If you're allowing the state with its political majorities, consensus, etc., to adjudicate the boundaries among these spheres, that in the long run is likely to lead to slippage and leviathan style and concentration of power. So I think if you really want to follow that logic, you need some kind of structure, quasi-judicial sort of structure of guardianship with very limited power, the sole purpose of which really is maintaining that metaconstitutional settlement of the boundaries among spheres. In other words, providing a kind of ultimate check on political power in the narrow sense. Um, now, in terms of how that goes to the, the variant style monopoly on the, the legitimate use of force, I mean, obviously a lot of proponents of world government have said that one of its greatest um, achievements or one of the markers of it having matured would be having a monopoly on force such that it would make war making by territorial states impossible for the first time in history. Now, I think that that, in the limited sense that you would no longer have states warring with each other, that clearly would be achievement. Um, I do think if you, you want to guarantee this kind of constitutional structure, you actually do need to differentiate what we mean by legitimate force. Right? So there's legitimate force in the sense of the routine policing, security, normal operation of state institutions. There's also something which we see hinted at in a lot of political practice and theory, which is a kind of exceptional reserve of force as a guarantee of a constitutional structure. Right? If we look at the role of constitutional monarchs within some systems, right? I mean, they are often seen as being the ultimate sort of guarantor of some kind of pre-political good that politicians should not be allowed to override in a crisis. So I would argue that that sort of structure of guardianship, which in a sense is above all of the spheres, 
probably should have a component of legitimate force reserve to it, which would not be enough to dominate society, control territory, etc., but could be the kind of offshore supplementary power such that in a crisis, together with a, this is going to sound very right-wing American of me, together with a well-armed public would be sufficient to be <laughs> There are ways of guaranteeing liberty at the point of two guns, if not one. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so, Joanne? Empire of Bases, and, and Sam saw a paper, and in the last part again, extending those metaphors, uh, the uh, frontiersmen and all of that, I'm wondering if there will be, uh, let's say, a break in the narrative, we go from uh, the frontiers person, in effect, to the uh, uh, Star Wars, Star Trek. Uh, I, I'm thinking of the bases, but very, very particularly, so we can move on. Mars and the moon as as bases, and, and I, I know Wade has a lot to say on this too. Is that a sound, is that a necessity? We as the U.S. claimed the moon as a base for the last 50 years because of the landing in 1969. Can we continue to claim that unless we put something on that they got on the moon as as China is, is trying to do within the next uh, 10, 20 years? Thank you. That's it. I think this is for Adam, but I think in the sense you uh, it's been anticipated. My question was, I mean, I think this sounds lovely, the idea of a, a kind of spherical sovereignty, but how do you guarantee that it won't drift towards precisely the kind of um, empire and state that you're hoping to avoid? And if I think of historical analogies, you know, the, the early United States constitution is kind of a spherical sovereignty type model. From, from the point of view of the, the British dominions, you know, from the, the British empire was very much a spherical kind of so, um, so okay, and, and so your answer to the last question was we have a court or you have a constitutional monarch. I would say that by reference to those historical analogies, the court is too powerful. Uh, and I would say it comes to, in fact, assist in, crea in creating a kind of empire state that you're trying to avoid. And the constitutional monarch is arguably not, not powerful enough. Um, so, that, that was, my question is basically how do you prevent the drift towards the fight of the for the last question? My question to Adam is uh, the inverse. Listening to you, I'm thinking of cases I know in Africa, for example, Mali. Uh, with, with most African states, um, uh, the state does not control very much of the, of the populace. Uh, uh, in fact, the state only exists for itself. Uh, any taxes that are collected just go to pay the officials of the state. Uh, that, that means that most social welfare or most social programs uh, are, are delegated out to local communities, uh, or, or they're taken by international NGOs, or even the IMF now uh, uh, encourages the devolution of, 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 of uh, local self-rule to, to, to local populations. But what that gives you uh, is a, a retrenchment of ethnicity, uh, and sometimes ethnicity in its worst form, so that for the, the, the Tuaregs have adopted universal Wahhabism to challenge the state violently, for example. Uh, and they've done that in such a way, I'm relying on a friend of mine who's the, the anthropo French anthropologist of, of the Tuareg, uh, by reinforcing a very old traditional division of labor between uh, warrior classes and, and other classes uh, who, who felt that their social prestige had been called into question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, um, there's also this, this I mean, and, and you also get the reinforcement of female genital mutilation and all other forms of what we would consider outrageous social practices uh, uh, by by delegating down. And for okay. for yeah, just a brief question for Wayne. Um, I, I, one one of the uh, uh, parts of the movement toward the the celebration of Creoleness in the in the Caribbean is, is the idea that as you suggested that we should develop a, a new kind of society based on other kinds of values, not capitalist values. What they have proposed is that these values should be creative artistic values. But be careful what you want, because in France, there, and there are probably theoreticians of this also in the, the English speaking <coughs> uh, one uh, philosopher, Gilles Lipovetsky, finds that what's been created uh, is an international artist capitalism. Uh, so, so artistic creation has been has been captured. Uh, it's been internationalized. Uh, so that now design and, and fashion and literature uh, is an amalgam 
uh, of all cultures, this is this, this, this metissage of all cultures that's sold. Uh, so that, that Lipovetsky pushes this too far because he sees that uh, that leads to a personalization of, of, of art and creation. Thank, that goes thank, to thank you, Art. So I propose to go in reverse order, giving David a chance he's asking a question directed to David. And just in, in one minute to say something about the future scenarios, one idea from the future scenarios, if you want. You know, one yeah. Just to give sure. you a chance. Go ahead. And then we'll go uh, Adam. Tim and Wayne will have the last word, which I know it sounds like a crazy idea. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess I think you know the basic question is about the, the, the viability of the Chinese model of capitalism, capitalism with capitalism, and how uh, how successful it would be, uh, and uh, and I guess you know the the, the top trade war is is in a sense we got a test of it, right? I mean, what he's, what he's doing is if, if, he, if he succeeds in, um, in establishing the tariffs and, 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 and in a sense he can either, I mean Trump can either um, force China to sort of um, open up its economy and sort of abide by kind of the types of rules that Trump wants to establish would be, which would be kind of opening up the, the, the Chinese economy to outside investment in an open way. Uh, in a sense, the, 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 the one track would be the Chinese economy integrates much better with the world economy. Uh, it has a kind of authoritarian, authoritarian capitalism that, that functions or might not function, but, but in any case, it would be uh, essentially uh, much more, there would, there would be not so much conflict as essentially with, uh, with the rest of the world in that way. And I think there would be a kind of a, a session to the, the kind of uh, uh, liberalism of the rest of the world. Um, I mean, but the alternative, though, I guess, would be um, if uh, I guess if, if China sort of tries to establish essentially its own alternative sphere of free market, um, it's got the Belt and Road Initiative, in which you can, you can imagine the kind of splitting up of the world into sort of these two different uh, different economic spheres, I suppose, uh, each one having its own. Uh, development and, and, and essentially a little bit separate from each other. So that would be. Um, just briefly to respond to both of those, I, I, mean, I find it interesting your, your description of knowledge because I think that pattern of a weak state and strong society is is actually the case in much of the global south, including in areas which demographically are growing the fastest in the century. So if we look at the the, the real center of gravity of global population, the youth bulge, and so on in the century, it's actually not places like rise of China. It's actually places like Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, etc. And I think that that impulse for strong society with a role for tradition and, and suspicions of overbearing states, that actually does align quite quite nicely with this kind of constitutional in terms of narrative that I'm trying to put, um, <coughs> put forth here. Um, I think that the concern that this would sort of empower these sort of um, atavistic ethno divisions and, and, and women's subordination and so on. One of the interesting things about a global space, which I think gets very little attention, is that no one would be in the majority, right? I mean, the mere fact that you are dealing with such a broader scale of diversity and pluralism demographically actually does blunt some of those kinds of local traditional forms of control and repression. So I think this would play out differently in a genuinely open global space than we might see now in, in Mali. And the same thing with women's um, position in, in, in societies like that. And I mentioned you know, choice of personal law along you know, Islamic personal law models and so on. And one of the critiques of that is, well, that tends to subordinate women. But I, I suspect that the lived experience of actually having a portable choice of law would actually raise that to a level of conscious choice over a couple of generations in a way that would lead to a fundamental transformation in terms of how people are relating to those traditions in a, in a healthier way, rather than it simply being taken for granted in a certain geographic setting at a certain time and place. Um, as far as the, um, I mean, the US and the UK is in the constitutional history, I mean, both of those, I mean, neither of those is really based on sphere sovereignty. In a sense, they're, they're empty vessels, right? And they're, they're ways of, of slowing down or tempering political majoritarianism. But, I mean, in the long run, it's very much the logic of the modern state and modern political majorities that flow through those institutions. I think Hannah Arendt actually regretted that localities were not given an entrenched role in the American Constitution, which might have been a buffer against certain kinds of, of centralization. I think what Hans Juvenel actually mentioned also that you know, it, it was an empty vessel in the sense that you're relying on the polity itself to check the polity. Right? You're not actually locking in these, these real alternative bases in society. And I think the, the impulse of this kind of 
circle or body of guardianship to maintain the constitutional structure would depend partly on where those people are drawn from. And if they're a creation of the state, then clearly their allegiance is going to be to the state, right? If they are drawn from these other spheres in society in a way that the, the lived personal commitments are to pluralism, then I think the not only the leverage, but also the temptation just to concentrate power along modern lines would be much less present than we've seen in liberal states. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I think that, sure, and that's a really interesting question. When I'm writing about the imperial empire, I think to a certain extent there's there's been a kind of hiatus with regard to the imperial empire with something Schmidt did, I think, anticipate, which is who gets to dump the most amount of carbon dioxide into it uh, over time. And uh, in, in, in balancing that, who releases that, I think there are two other liminal spaces besides the that atmosphere for carbon loading, which has been the Arctic, the cryosphere is basically just don't fit and die in one of these places very well. And in them, like space, they're kind of places where I think the international order has been trying to create a higher uh, hierarchical appropriation. In 1967, there's this treaty governing the extraterrestrial use of space to try to prevent militarization. Yeah, everybody trying to appropriately use it in some, you know, for the goodness of being kind or whatnot. But like the disappearing Arctic now, I think, you know, people are claiming the seabed and uh, there, there are in, there's a, an apparent attempt to sort of quasi you know, fully nationalize spatial these kinds of uh, in, in, interplanetary what I call off the off world empire possibilities beyond the out of the blue empire of, of uh, aerial uh, issues. So that's a kind of these liminal spaces that we've been it's really since 1980 trying to negotiate. But where ultimately leads is yes, one would imagine like you know what it was space odyssey, there's a lunar days and it's from the goodness of all mankind, and even though TWA is bankrupt, uh, you know, you're gonna fly there on some kind of space liner and you know, maybe you discover a monolith or whatever. But then there is uh, there is a number of probability of a lunar base because of water, the same, you know, eventually we are there are many nations exploring Mars because of the potential resources there. Lunar bases are good for manufacturing. Yeah. Just want to, a little plug for this yeah. for now. So all all of those are interesting questions that I think might force the kinds of questions that, you know, be, that we're thinking about. I mean, you know, David's really in many ways ideas to trace Barnett's notion of the the functioning core of the world and how does it manage its affairs versus the non-integrated gap to contain conflict and then move on to answer these bigger problems. And, and all of these are efforts, I think, to, to negotiate that idea, which is maybe an, an empire without an imperial council. Thank you, sir. Um, it seems to me that there are three things we have to address quite clearly. One is, what is the nature of the present economic regimes in the world and how do we get rid of them? And I think we have to get rid of capitalism. And I say that from a non-left point of view, if, that, if you understand. I think that is technical. I didn't argue for new values. I meant it in a political economy sense, an economy that does not seek to produce value. Because societies are not based on production of value, and we can produce a new kind of society that doesn't produce value. That's a technical discussion. There are 30 or 40 books on that. Uh, the second thing is the problem of law, which I think I want to bring David into discussion because what David's saying is extremely useful and needs discussion. Uh, the trouble with law, because I'm a lawyer, is because I'm a lawyer, the last thing I'd ever do is study your legal system if I wanted to know what you were doing in your country. I wouldn't read your constitution. Certainly, I wouldn't read the constitution of Stalin's Russia, which I haven't had studied. I would see who's got the money and who's got the wealth and who's got the power and who are they raping now. And I would take a hard line on that on all societies and all institutions. I don't buy soft line on power or wealth. And I think human beings intrinsically rape other human beings. So I have a hard, non-traditional left line on that. I do think most important, I really don't about that. But we shouldn't describe political regimes legally. This leads into the nonsense of German constitutionalism. 
or American constitutionalism, <laughs> it leads into not knowing why your system has just failed. And I wouldn't reach for it to know what happened in the First World War or anything, uh, but that's a personal bigotry of mine. Uh, <laughs> the last thing is climate and the Anthropocene, which we've mentioned occasionally, but it's absolutely fundamental. If our present economic system is destroying the Earth, if we are returning to an age of cosmic violence, if the Earth is going to blow up, we're going to need Mars. So I really think the climate <laughs> thing is absolutely fundamental, and the current evidence is that if we have capitalism and a sort of pseudo-legal order, we will destroy the Earth. So I agree entirely with that about the need for change. I agree with about two-thirds of his ideas. I don't agree with the doya that because I, have a, being a Dutch speaker, I know all about doya that I know all about those people. This was tried in the Netherlands and it failed, as you'll remember. It's never succeeded anywhere. And it's all based on neo-Kantian logic, which, as you know, Dan, is the worst logic ever written. <laughs> <laughs> I conclude. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> to all the